Hi there, we're going to look at high woodwind voicings today. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a short melody and I'm going to lay it out in lots of different ways and you can see what the effect of all the different sounds are. Now when we have um, what I'm calling the high woodwinds, which includes the clarinets that actually go quite low, but nevertheless they do tend to play a really significant part up high uh, as well. They're kind of like, in my mind, they're the kind of cello of the woodwind section. Um, there are lots and lots of different options here. So I'm going to go through as many as I can and we'll see what the different effects are, the, you know, the different kind of layouts, having things at unison and all that kind of stuff. So starting off, um, looking at the flute and the piccolo. So the piccolo is tiny, but it cuts through at the top of its range. Uh, it can cut right through everything else in the orchestra, incredibly loud for such a tiny thing. So um, it has a very similar timbral characteristic of the flute, but it is basically plays an octave higher. You lose the bottom C, so it goes from the D. Um, uh, so there's a slight difference there at the bottom. But essentially, it's you can double the flute an octave up with the piccolo. Um, now, what... In the same way that we looked at the cellos and basses, um, let's look first at what happens if you have the flute and the piccolo playing at the same pitch. So we'll, we'll put in uh, a little melody on the flute, first of all. Okay, and then let's double that at pitch. We can just about do that because it goes down to that D, which is the bottom note of the piccolo. Uh, it sounds like this. Now, um, what I'm going to do in this session is I'm just going to put each example uh, going on to the next example, and I'm going to link below the session file. So if you want to download it and have a mess around with it um, on your own and listen to the to the combinations in the comfort of your own studio, then go ahead and do that. Um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take the flutes a three. So this is the recorded section of three flutes, and I'm going to play the same melody using those. Okay, kind of similar, <laughs> one note different. Now, what you're getting from this, I hope, is that the sound of the piccolo and the flutes playing at the same pitch is different in character from, and, I, and it's not just because there are three flutes as opposed to two instruments, um, what we heard before. The main difference is that you've got a slight timbral difference with the piccolo because the body is smaller. So that the, uh, the kind of harmonic um, register or the harmonic profile of the instrument is shifted up uh, to the upper range. So it does sound different from just having a bunch of flutes playing the same thing. Um, but not that different. Now, where we get a really significant change is when we take the flute up an octave. So first of all, let's compare the flute playing the same part. So I'll just copy that over. And then we'll record the piccolo part onto that, but up the octave. Okay, here we go. Okay, so already you're hearing quite a significant change there. Now, if we copy that part over and we play the flutes on the flutes at three and listen to the sound of that. So we've got three flutes playing the uh, melody down below and then the piccolo doubling that an octave up. Now that's a more satisfying sound because you've got more density on the bottom octave um, and having the piccolo up the octave is kind of acting almost like the, the first harmonic um, of the flute sound. But it, it's not the overall sound is not as thin as if you just have one flute and one piccolo. So um, what happens if we let's copy this over again. And let's go back to a solo flute here 
and then I'm going to add another solo flute up the octave and we'll see how that differs as well. Here we go. So again, that's quite a nice sound, um, but you don't get the same kind of power as you do when you've got the piccolo playing the top part. Let's start introducing some um, different kind of combination. We'll stay, we'll stay with this idea for now and keeping everything either at unison or in octaves. And then afterwards, we'll go back and look at harmony options as well. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to try doubling a flute and an oboe, and then we'll compare that to a flute and a clarinet. And we're going to do a couple of different ways. We're going to uh, play them at the same pitch um, first up. So I'll copy that part over on the flute. And then, uh, first of all, I'll play that at the same pitch on the oboe. Now we're at the top of the range for the oboe. So uh, just think about timbral differences as I play. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, let's do the same thing with the clarinet. Now again, um, with our kind of timbral uh, thing going on, I, I, I think about the clarinet as kind of the, like the cello of the woodwind section in that it goes down low and it goes up high. That's my reasoning there. Um, so I do think it works up high. Um, but what we're not really getting from this, you know, we've got the, the instruments are, are kind of so different in their range here where you're playing them at the same pitch. So we're going to take the same flute part and I'm going to play the, the oboe down the octave. Okay, so that's sounding kind of interesting. Now, for me, when as the oboe goes down in its range and it becomes kind of more strident and dare I say, uh, kind of more mid-rangey, I would say, rather than kind of honky, um, what we're getting is we're getting a bit of a mismatch because as the flute's coming down, it's getting weaker. And as the oboe's coming down, you're getting that mid-range really poking out. So one way around this is to look at the... Uh, at the oboe doubling an octave down from flutes F3. And that sounds like this. So the flutes can hold their own a little bit more now that you've got the kind of extra strength um, of having three players on there. And uh, one thing which kind of expands it even more is when you add in another section. I'm, I'm going to, we are going to do clarinets as well and look at the octaves, but just for, uh, just for interest, let's look at the same part um, and let's add the piccolo up the octave again. So now we've got a slightly better kind of balance. Um, and the final piece of the puzzle is to look at what happens if we put the, the, all of the oboes in um, as a section as well. So let's copy this all over. Um, let's move the oboe part down to the oboes a three track and have a listen to that. Okay, so that's interesting. While we've got that sound fresh in our mind's eye, let's take the oboes out and let's put clarinets at three and I'm just gonna play this in again. So that sounds like this. Okay, so that's interesting. And then finally, uh, looking at the difference when we play a solo clarinet underneath. Okay, so you're getting an idea here of when you are, um, you know, th these instruments blend together really well. 
all you're doing when you kind of decide how many players you want on each part and how and where the octaves are is you're kind of shifting the balance up and down the, you know, it's the same melody, but you're shifting the balance, um, you know, upwards and downwards, depending on the kind of weight or the, if you imagine it like a kind of center of gravity, you've got, um, you know, as you kind of add weights on this side, the seesaw will kind of tip to that side. As you add weights on this side, it tips back to this side. So we've got two, two kind of things that we can use here. We've got the, the sections versus the soloists, and we've got the octave kind of, you, you know, the octave that we're using um, and how that affects the kind of timbral character of the sound that we're hearing. If we take this flute melody again and we play that on a solo flute, um, we haven't yet investigated the difference um, between the flute and the oboe. So just going back um, a little bit just to hear flute solo and oboe on their own is here. So just uh, have a quick listen to this and then I'll play it with the clarinet instead. Okay, so keep that in your mind. And here we go, flute and clarinet. Okay, so that's at pitch. And here it is with the clarinet, the octave down. Okay, so a couple of things to note here. Um, at pitch, they blend really, really well. And it almost becomes like a slightly different character flute section. You still, for me, it kind of keeps its character, it keeps the more fluty character because uh, I'm guessing that maybe that's because the kind of, you're hearing more of the flute harmonics. Um, so they, they kind of pop out to your ear a little bit more and the clarinet is tucked in behind. Um, but also uh, when it's down the octave, you're getting a kind of uh, a, a different kind of timbral balance. And then the clarinet starts to come forward a bit more. Um, the clarinet is slightly stronger when, whereas the flute is kind of lower in its range. So the flute is slightly weaker. If we go back, so let's look at the clarinet. We've got the we've, we've got our flute uh, back, and I'm, I'm putting up the score paper now. It's getting a little bit kind of complicated to keep keep all this stuff in our head. Um, so as you can see, that's got the little eight above the treble clef. So this is an octave up. So it's G, an octave and a half above middle C. Now, if we add the clarinet to that, that sounds like this. Okay, so that's quite interesting. For me, the uh, balance isn't quite right. So the first thing that I would do is I would check how that works if we have three flutes versus one clarinet. So three flutes and the clarinet solo playing at pitch. And that sounds like this. Okay, it's a better balance. Um, just out of interest, let's hear with three clarinets, just so that we've got the comparison as well here. So again, at pitch. So for me, uh, three flutes and three clarinets at pitch blend slightly better than the solo clarinet. Um, so something else to bear in mind there. But what happens if we split them up? So, um, so the first thing is we'll go back to our solo flute here and we'll play the clarinet an octave down now. So the flutes are up here and the clarinet's gonna be an octave below. Right, it's already a more pleasing sound and we can duplicate that uh, effect with the three flutes and three clarinets and hear exactly the same thing. Uh, 
Okay, so that's all sounding good. While we've got that fresh in our mind's eye, what happens if we reverse the octaves? So we put the flutes below and put the clarinets above. I'm not gonna labor the point, uh, but for me, that really doesn't work at all. Um, I guess you can do kind of, you can use this, these things for effects, but to, the flutes need to sit on top or be at pitch for me. When, you, when they drop below, they just get completely lost. So, and, and it just doesn't seem to sound right to, to my ear. So let's now look at the combination of the clarinet and oboe. So first up, we'll try at pitch. That's an interesting sound. Uh, let's now try putting the oboe up the octave. So I'm just going to, um, so I'll just play that in uh, over the clarinet that we had before. Okay, that sounds quite interesting. Um, what happens if we reverse that? So let's bring the oboe down and take the clarinet up. Interesting effect. Uh, again, for me, it kind of doesn't sound as good. I'm, I'm, I much prefer having the oboe above the clarinets. Um, but, you know, it's just, again, it's a color that you can use for a specific effect. Final thing to do is to copy those guys onto the A3 tracks. Let's have a quick listen to the sections. And then again, we'll reverse the octaves. And then just for the sake of completeness, we copy that over and go back to our original transposition. So oboes above the clarinets. Really different sound. I mean, it's useful It's useful just going through these exercises. I really, really encourage you to pick a, just a little bit of music, could, could be anything, um, and just try even actually picking, pick, um, find a score with a section that you like um, and then get the parts into Logic or into Cubase, whatever you use, and mess around with the um, different woodwind parts and see what it sounds like if you rearrange it and if you have the flute's playing what the clarinets are playing and vice versa and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's getting these sounds into your head that really, really helps. I remember a, um, an interview with John Barry where he was talking about when he was in the uh, armed forces and he did a correspondence course with, I think it was Stan Kenton. And um, he did a variety of things, but the, but the one thing that he really concentrated on was his ear training and didn't just apply to the arrangements that he was making and experimenting and, and you know, being able to try stuff out with the band that he had. Um, but also things like, you know, chord changes. What does it sound like when you go, you know, up a minor third and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so ear training gives you um, a kind of palette of sounds in your mind's eye that will enable you to kind of short circuit your writing so when you kind of when you you've, you know if you can picture in your head the sound of for example the flute and the piccolo uh, in octaves or you know the three octave range with the clarinet flute piccolo once you've got that sound and you kind of know what that sounds like in your head then you know when you want to use that sound and it becomes incredibly um, useful and quick to be able to arrange this kind of stuff um so i think i think we've kind of covered most of what I wanted to cover in the octave kind of thing. Now, what happens when we start adding in uh, harmonies and things like that? Well, th this is where the woodwinds work really, really well. Um, when, once you 
start splitting out the parts, um, there are really only two decisions you need to make. So the first thing is to remember that the flute sounds quite different from the piccolo. So for me, um, having flute harmonies uh, like the flute, the flute's in a third, um, always sounds more successful than the piccolo's in a third. I'm going to show you that now. Feel free to disagree with me and tell me I'm an idiot. Um, and let's put the same uh, little part down. We'll put them down on flute and flute first. So let's add a flute part, kind of. Something like that. Kind of weird, almost kind of modal, um, but you hear the sound. But if we copy that over and I just put that on the piccolo. So uh, these are, you know, so they're, they're actually now closer than, than we would usually use them if we're not using them at unison, uh, because of, you know, as we said, we'd probably put them in octaves, but have a listen to this. Now, for me, um, you know, it's quite a sweet sound, but the danger is that you are massively uh, overpowering the poor flute on her own with the piccolo. Now, uh, one way around that is to put all three flutes and then the piccolo just sat above them. Uh, you, in a typical symphonic section, probably the third flute would be doubling piccolo. But let's say you've got three just to give us uh, an idea here. Already working much better. And let's say for the sake of argument that we only had single woodwinds, um, I would probably double that with a, a clarinet. And let's see what that sounds like. Already sounding better. You've got the strength underneath to kind of counteract the slightly pokier sound of the piccolo. Um, now, what happens if we, uh, even, even with the assistance of the clarinet, um, let's then take the piccolo up the octave. So uh, it is spaced uh, by an octave and a third above the flute and clarinet and see what that sounds like. So now you're hearing that really big kind of gap there, um, apart from the kind of nautical hornpipey type effect, it doesn't sound that great. So this, these, this big gap here, um, not so good. Now my rule of thumb when I'm uh, arranging my high woodwinds is not to have any, any massive gaps like that. Um, I just feel that you lose the kind of cohesion of the section and it splinters into kind of very disparate sounds. Um, one thing which is, which is quite useful to uh, have a listen to is the different instruments um, with those thirds. So what we should do is let's, let's copy this over quickly. Um, we'll put that back down where it was. So this part here is, is a third uh, above. Let me just hide the UI for now. Um, and shrink that a little bit. Uh, so we've got that uh, part is basically kind of tracking a third or a fourth above the uh, original flute part here. What happens then if we put that on the oboe and then immediately after that, we'll listen to it uh, played on the clarinet. So we've got the oboe above and then the clarinet above. I'm just gonna stretch this out. And that sounds like this. Okay, interesting. Now let's reverse those roles and let's put the flute on the upper part. 
and the oboe and the clarinet on the lower parts. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these things over. I'm going to, so this remember is the lower, lower part of our pairing and here is the upper part. Um, so we're going to put the flute on the upper part both times and then first up we've got the oboe playing the lower part, second we've got the clarinet playing the lower part. Okay, interesting, um, all still sounding good, uh, but I kind of preferred it the other way around, <laughs> just with these particular voicings. Um, what happens when we interlace? I think the, this, is kind of, this is kind of where we come to maybe our conclusion for this, for this section, um, is to look at uh, interlacing the different sections. Now, um, I'm going to use the solo instruments just to keep it nice and clear. We're going to look at a four part chord. We're going to have two flutes at the top and then two oboes or clarinets underneath. So um, I'm going to play something slightly different for this just to kind of vary it up a bit. Um, and we're going to play, I'll harmonize it on the fly. Why don't we just, let's just make them parallel chords. Let's make it kind of, it, it makes it harder for the instruments because when our ear is not being distracted by, by things moving in different directions. Now, first up, uh, let's do the oboes. So I'm just gonna copy the top part down um, so that that's, that's an octave below. Um, so what we've got, just to kind of look through here, we start on the D and then on the A, and then our, uh, our bottom part is just an octave down. So we're going to fill in with the third uh, above that, and that sounds like this. Our kind of choir is two flutes, two oboes. Now, that's a great sound. The next thing to do is to check out exactly the same thing, but with clarinets instead. Similar, but a very different kind of feel to the sound, a very different character to the sound. Um, just to be completist, let's copy that over again, and let's listen to clarinets and oboes. So the oboes are on top, Clarets underneath. Finally, it would be fun to kind of swap those over uh, and see what they sound like. Again, really useful color. So you, you're getting the idea that these, the pairings having the individual instruments um, closely written with each other is a really great sound and it blends really well. It doesn't seem, you can kind of move that stuff around. You can, you know, you can have uh, any of the instruments kind of playing the top line. And we could even, even change, let's make it as difficult as possible um, by basically taking, so we'll take this version here where the oboe's playing the top. And if you remember the clarinet was playing the bottom part, let's pull that over and duplicate that. And I'm going to put those lower parts on the individual flutes. So just to, and it's getting a little bit confusing with the um, naming of the tracks. Um, so when I get to the end, what I'm actually going to do is I'll just copy track name to um, onto all of the regions. So it, it becomes a little bit simpler. But we've got, if you look at these two oboe parts and note your little eight there, we've got the top two parts on the oboes and then the flutes underneath. And again, it sounds great. So not to labor that point, um, we're, I'm, I'm really happy with the way that all of that is sounding. Now I'm gonna take the 
original arrangement, which was the two flutes over the two oboes. Now, what can we do with this? Well, we can take the parts and we can interlock them. So now what we're doing is we've got, again, our D start for the, on the high flute, then a sixth down uh, for the second flute part. The oboe sits in between those, oboe one sits on that A in between, and then underneath the bottom flute. So we've got flute, oboe, flute, oboe. Now it's a really nice sound, and uh, let, let me just duplicate it with the clarinets, just so you can hear the alternative. So we're changing the uh, overall kind of timbre of the sound um, with the oboes in, it's a little bit reedier. With the clarinets in, it's a little bit woodier. Um, we can even do a third version. Uh, having said, I'm not going to labor the point. I'm now laboring it furiously um, with the two flutes, an oboe and the clarinet. So the clarinets. Um, OK, jumping, jumping back. Uh, we've just to get back to our interlocking thing. Um, I have just noticed that um, I've got the flutes in sixth. Yes, as, as before, um, my first oboe tucked in the middle there. And then I noticed that the um, bottom oboe part was actually playing an octave up. So let's hear that again, but with that, with that still as a four part chord with octaves on the outside. Still lovely. Let's take the clarinet down the octave as well. So we're back to. Okay. And then where we were just getting to was to try uh, using one oboe and one clarinet, still with the interlace. So the highest part is on the, that flute one. Uh, we've got a six down for our flute two. We've got our oboe in the middle of those, and then our clarinet is going to be at the bottom. So let's just transpose that down again. And that sounds like this. And then for the sake of completeness, we'll copy that over and I'm going to swap over the uh, clarinet and oboe. So now the clarinet's tucked in the middle of the flutes and the oboe's at the bottom. Now, not as successful for me because the oboe is now poking out too much because it's right at the bottom of its range where if you remember, I wouldn't dare say honky, but it kind of does get really mid rangey and forward right down the bottom end there. Uh, as you can see here, we try and ignore the little eight that Logic has decided to insert there. I think some key takeaways from, from me are, it's similar to the strings. Watch the uh, timbral character of the instrument as it goes through its range. Think about where it's strong, where if there are any significant changes, you know, as I said, the clarinet, um, I think of as the cello in the sense that it goes down deep and it goes up high. You've got that tiny little chalamo range in the middle, um, which is just where uh, you go. For, you know, that's the kind of middle register. Actually, it's not the middle register because there's a there's an upper register, um, but it's the gap between the lower register and the middle register around about, uh, you know, that kind of. F, G, A above middle C, at that point it becomes quite weak all of a sudden, but it's not that noticeable. Um, the, the range, across the range, it's very, very similar in its character. And then with the oboe, you've got that slightly uh, mid-rangey um, push forward at the bottom, and it becomes uh, harder to blend down there. Um, so think about those things. Um, try uh, and do, when, you, when you're... Uh, Let's say you're creating a part like this um, and you're looking at how you're going to orchestrate the actual um, chords within the woodwind section. Think about these different options. There's loads and loads of different options. All of them have their own characteristic sound. And, um, you know, there's some really useful colors in there that you can use um, to just change the feel of what you're writing. You know, you can take it towards a kind of more you know, Arabian style 
by using the oboes in a certain way. Um, you know, even having the oboes at the top, which, you know, we tried a little bit further back, um, really changes the kind of emphasis of the feel of those chords. And then you can go into that kind of, you know, there's almost a kind of medieval sound that you can get from some things. Um, you can get a very kind of lyrical kind of countryside sound, get a very kind of dry, um, you know, kind of deserty, very still kind of sound. There's lots and lots of different colors to be had within the woodwind section. And the woodwind section, poor woodwinds are the most forgotten about, it seems, these days. Um, but um, hopefully, as you can hear, if I've been able to demonstrate it well enough, there is a ton of really useful color to be had um, within the woodwind section. This is enough uh, to keep this kind of, uh, again, trying to keep it kind of bite size. Um, we're going to look in uh, the future at the woodwinds doubling the other sections because there's some very interesting and sometimes counterintuitive effects that you get when the woodwinds um, are doubled with other instrument groups. But that's for another video. Hope some of that was useful. Uh, again, I'm going to just sort of tidy this up a little bit just by copying the names of the um, tracks across the regions. And then I'll whack it below, link below, and you'll be able to hopefully just load it up and have a little play around yourself. Thanks very much for watching. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.